morning, good very early morning, uh, depends on where you are across the globe. Uh, and welcome to our webinar uh, about the best content strategy for your funnel. Uh, we're going to start in a couple of minutes. Um, if you're using the GoToWebinar app, you are able to write questions uh, and to uh, ask questions through the app itself or add your comments in the chat. We'll, we'll do the best we can in order to, uh, to answer them. This webinar is recorded. So um, you will be able to uh, to re review it, view it again at a later stage. After the event itself, we will send you an email with um, with the webinar content itself. Should we start here? Yes, let's let's start. I can't wait. Okay, so I'm here with uh, Yael Kochman. Would you like to introduce yourself? Sure, Kfir. So. Um, I'm Yael Kochman. I'm the head of marketing at Rujum, which is a company that developed a platform for packaging content, um, if we say it as simple as it is. Um, I'm also uh, a blogger and a speaker about content marketing and content performance. And my name is Kfir Pravda. I'm the CEO of Pravda Media Group, uh, a marketing, uh, a B2B digital marketing company. We provide services to uh, medium and uh, enterprise companies uh, that sell the technology products worldwide. Um, and when Ellen and I talked about uh, doing a webinar together, one of the things that we talked about a lot about is the importance of content in B2B digital marketing today. So I wanted to ask you, uh, Yael, why do you think that this is something that we should actually discuss? Because companies are used to spend a lot of money on different marketing activities, right? Yeah, I think that most companies have already come to an understanding that they need to have content and they need to do content marketing. Uh, the question is how, where to start, um, you know, what type of content performs better, how to measure the content that we're creating. I mean, a lot of the times it's really hard to see the direct connection between the content that we're producing and the leads or the sales that we're getting eventually. Uh, so it's really hard to maintain um, a strategy on the one hand, to have you know enough time and resources to create all of that content that you know once we get our users um, used to the fact that we are serving them all of this great content, they just want more and more of it, and we're here to serve obviously. But it, do t it, it does take a lot of time and resources, um, and finally measuring the ROI of everything. Yeah, that's that's a that's a huge challenge to measure the ROI of this effort, especially when chief marketing officers and marketers in general are being pushed to prove their value. Isn't it right? I mean, we see more and more in companies that with terms like revenue marketing and all those nice buzzwords, and then the uh, CEOs are asking, uh, "What did you do for me today?" Uh, and this is a question that is uh, not necessarily that easy to answer when we're talking about the budget line of uh, of content marketing. Um, another thing that we've seen. A lot of the mainly larger companies and enterprises is that the marketing organization is built around campaigns. The budgeting is built around campaigns, and the whole operation is built around campaigns, which means basically um, giving a major push in a specific point in time uh, in order to push a specific message. While content marketing needs a constant effort across the year, across the board, in order to be effective, uh, which makes it harder to, uh, to quantify and to measure the ROI itself. Um, right. And then we ask, you don't, you know, sometimes you don't see the results right away. With content marketing, you need to have a lot of patience because eventually, um, you might have, um, you might have, you might see the results in six months from now for uh, something that you're creating today. That's, that's a very important point. I read an interesting research done by HubSpot that they looked into uh, the value that companies. Uh, generate out of inbound marketing, which is the purest content marketing effort. Right? You put the content out there and people hit it voluntarily and then turn into leads. Um, and their stats, based on, if I'm not mistaken, around 22,000 different uh, programs that they've, uh, that they've analyzed uh, together with MIT, was that actually you can measure content marketing uh, only six months after you launch an inbound program. Uh, only then the cost per lead or the ROI measurement makes sense. 
And this is something which is very, very uh, hard to, uh, 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 to get across um, for companies that are, especially when the company itself is, is used to work on shorter, uh, shorter terms. Uh, for example, when you do a PPC campaign, uh, you have results 24 hours later, you are able to measure the, the cost per lead. When you're doing an email campaign, you're able to ignore it by, you know, 48 hours after. But that's it, right? And here with content marketing, it's much more complex. Um, then the question is, why should we even invest in it? Uh, the truth is that things are very, very, very complex today to, uh, to companies, especially in the B2B market. If in the past, you know, I came from the telecom market in the year 2000, I was selling a, a product to, uh, to Deutsche Telekom and Telesonera. Uh, and back then, if Deutsche Telekom wanted to buy a specific technology, they go to one or two events. Uh, they had uh, two or three uh, publications uh, that they used to read. And if my company back then wanted to reach out to them, we just need to have a booth, uh, buy some ad space, some bylines, and that's it. Uh, and whenever Deutsche Telekom wanted to, uh, uh, to actually learn about the solution or learn about uh, a way to solve their problem, they would talk. They would speak with the vendors at a very, very early stage. What we see today is that around 70% of the buying cycle happens without any uh, discussion with the seller, meaning the buyers themselves are self-educating. They are coming to the seller when they already know what they want to buy, and that's a challenge because. You know, if the world was per were perfect, nobody would have talked would have talked with those uh, with those buyers. But what actually happens is, if you're not talking with your buyer, then your competitor is talking with your buyer and affects their buying decision process and the way they value different solutions. So when we talked about it with one of our customers, he told us, "Okay, so we have enough sales team, uh, sales team that is large enough actually to call the people that use our website and leave their details on our website and see if they're interested or not." And then the other stat is, both of them basically are based on a, on a research done by Google in the past. 98% of um, the visitors of your website are not sales ready. It means that if you're going to give them a call uh, with a sales pitch, they will be annoyed. Uh, it will be very inefficient. Uh, and you might lose them down the road because you are too eager. right? So you need to have this a very smart content platform in order to enable you to face those challenges. Another thing is that, especially when you're talking about large organizations, organizations that have long sales cycles, that are in a very competitive age, in a very competitive market, um, the whole idea of demand generation is a, becomes a bit fuzzy because the companies themselves, it's not a single market company, uh, sorry, a single company market, meaning it's not that there is one provider that everybody goes to buy from it, which means that the company itself has to fight for their audience. So it's not about uh, generating demand. Uh, it's more about nurturing and harvesting it. Because if you're in a competitive market, other companies are talking about the same problem that you are trying to solve. They are offering solutions around the same area that you are trying to solve. And then it means that you need to know how to identify those who are really interested in buying uh, before, uh, in order to be very, very efficient in your sales process. Do you see it also in your uh, problems when you're trying to sell your product? Definitely. And um, the, if we were talking about challenges before, I think that you know, if we have thousands or even ten, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people coming to our website, and the opposite side of uh, the 98% is those 2% that are ready to buy, how do we identify those? Yeah, that's, that's, that's a real challenge, especially when we're considering we're looking at salaries. The salespeople are the ones that are, in many cases, very, very expensive. This is a, a very uh, a large portion of the revenue engine of the company. Uh, therefore, we really need to make sure that we're using their time in the best way possible. Not so only that, webinar, but if, uh, uh, if we call yeah. a customer before they're ready to buy, we might lose them as a customer later down the funnel. Exactly, exactly. Um, we talked about the funnel, so let's just uh, uh, have a baseline of what we're talking about, actually. What you see here now on the screen is uh, a classic um, diagram of a funnel. Um, I wish that life would have been so simple, but it's uh, a best, the best way today to, uh, to uh, simplify 
the situation that we are facing. So we have the general awareness process that we are trying to get people to know about our company or about our product. We usually measure it by exposure. Uh, it's, a bit of fuzz, it's a bit of fuzzy KPI, but it is KPI that we are trying to measure in different ways. When we're looking at the digital funnel, um, some of this awareness will be translated to incoming traffic to our website. Um, and this website will be, at this the traffic at this stage will be anonymous, meaning we don't know who they are. If we do a good job, we will get them to leave their details on, in order to download some piece of content, and we'll talk about it in a second. And if we manage to do that, they will become known. Uh, they will become a known lead. And that, at that stage, here's one of the biggest changes in the funnel. Uh, when you're looking about the funnel today compared to the funnel seven years ago. The known leads are coming into our system, they're being uh, uh, registered in our CRM or our marketing automation platform in a relatively early stage. And then we need to engage and nurture them. This, is a, this could be a very long process. And only a small portion of those leads will eventually turn into marketing qualified leads. Now, each company defines the marketing qualified leads in a different way. But at the end of the day, this is the most important KPI, key performance indicator, for the marketing team. How many relevant people do we have, or relevant accounts, or relevant companies, do we have in our database? Some of them are actually looking for a solution in uh, a specific period of time, and they will be turned into a sales qualified lead. Um, and those leads uh, will be then uh, turned into opportunities, and the, the sales team will be engaged with them. Um, the thing is that if you win a deal or if you lose a deal, it's not the end of the funnel. And I think in your slides you're, you're uh, uh, going a bit deeper into that. But in general, smart companies recycle their funnel, which means that if I want to deal with a specific company, then the same company is still a sales qualified lead because I can do upsell or sell something else in my portfolio. Um, if I lost the deal with them, then they are still a marketing qualified lead because they are the right persona, the right company, and so on. The recycling is a very important part of the whole of the whole uh, picture. Um, so this is something that takes us to the next stage, and the next stage is the biggest challenges that we have. We need to continuously, and that's the important part of the whole thing, continuously provide value in the right place, the right time, and in the right format. Meaning where our audience wants to read it. It might be on LinkedIn, it might be on our blog, it might be on an interesting publication, it might be on a billboard uh, at the right time when it's really relevant for their decision making process. And in the right format, because it's not that we can take uh, a blog post and put it as is on Twitter, for example, we need to uh, uh, align the format with the platform that we are using. But that's not the only thing. The, the other thing, which is going back to the point that you raised, we need to identify the revenues to buy. Um, because this is, as you said, this is the most important part. As soon as we have readiness to buy, we know that we are able to engage with the salespeople. Exactly. Um, yes, please. No, I was just um, saying that this is, in fact, uh, the true point. I mean, um, we're investing all, all this time and efforts bringing people to our website and to the content that we write. And eventually, we have no idea if those people are um, uh, are already ready to buy, or even at what stage of the funnel they're currently at. Okay. Now, just one important point: almost everything that we're going to show uh, in this short webinar, almost everything that we're going to show, uh, is based on uh, the assumption that companies have marketing automation. Uh, marketing automation is a transformative technology that is crucial for success in content marketing. Uh, the reason is uh, that marketing automation enables us to look at a lead from multi-channel approach, meaning look at them, uh, at the engaged with them across email, uh, website visits, uh, the type of content that they download, and so on. We're able to identify the specific, uh, the specific activities that they've done. Um, based on their name, which means unlike Google Analytics that we see how many people visited our site, in marketing automation we know who specifically visited our site. Unlike Google Analytics that only provides us goal tracking, we are also able to score, uh, meaning it's a mechanism that enables us to actually know who, um, who is deeper in the funnel than others based on their behavior and their demographics. 
And I like Google Analytics, it only provides data. Uh, marketing automation also provides an automated engagement capabilities based on the behavior itself. Before we, we, uh, we uh, go a bit deeper, um, are there any questions? One of the questions here was about, it sounds like you're talking mostly about B2B. Will you talk also about B2C? So a lot of the things here will be focusing more about B2B. However, um, there are B2C funnels that um, are exactly the same, behave exactly the same. For example, people who want to buy uh, an apartment or people who buy a car. Uh, this is my part of the presentation. I think Yael has also additional insights for, for B2C parts, right? Uh, some of it, yes. Okay. So we'll also address uh, uh, B2C as well. Okay. So I want to make a point well, about uh, the definition between B2B and B2C. Um, yes. Today we know that eventually, even if we're selling to, to business clients, we're still, at the end of the day, we have a person behind the line or behind the, the screen that is making the decision. And this person has you know, individual thoughts, individual interests, uh, knowledge, experience. So I'm, I'm not sure, I, I think that even though uh, your examples are mostly related to B2B, at the end of the day, everything today is pretty much the same. That's true. Um, another question that was raised was, how do, we, uh, how do we manage multiple decision makers in the funnel? And we're going to talk about it exactly in two slides for now. So uh, let's look at, at three content strategies. Um, what you see here are three general content strategies that are employed by companies. Uh, each one fits a different company size, stage, uh, and capability in the company itself. Uh, one is the naive approach. One is funnel and persona, which is, uh, goes back to the question that was raised just now about multiple decision makers. Uh, and the other one is engagement, which is a bit more, uh, it's another layer on top of funnel and persona. Uh, as you can see, each of these content strategies require a different level of effort, but it also provides a different level of results. Uh, and we'll go into that uh, in the next slide. So the naive content strategy, strategy says, is, is based on the following. Um, a company already has usually a marketing program, uh, a marketing plan. And this marketing plan uh, has specific events, uh, a webinar. Uh, they're going to specific conferences. They are launching. Uh, they have a new uh, uh, feature in the product and so on. And the most basic content strategy is the following. We're taking whatever we're doing across the year and we're just augmenting it. We're augmenting it with additional types of content. So if we're going to a conference, as you see here on the screen, um, we will also write a blog post about it and we'll also do some kind of a, a Twitter strategy around it to increase the awareness for the fact that we're going to that conference. And if we have a white paper, we create multiple types of content around this white paper to augment and to increase the traffic that you are getting uh, to download the or incoming traffic that is required to download this traffic. And if we're doing our own uh, announcement, our own event, we're using those platforms in, in order to actually uh, just augment what we're doing today in, in other channels. Um, usually companies that don't have a content operation in place start with that. The reason is that creating a content engine within a company is a challenge. Uh, it requires budget, work processes, um, different state of mind, um, and it's not something that is uh, easy to implement. So many companies start with that. They're saying, we have in the, in the next 12 months, we have this event, let's have an operation in place that knows how to use the content marketing tools in the most basic level, but let's first of all have them in place. Uh, and that's a very important part of the evolution of companies um, in the content marketing uh, in the content marketing area. The next type uh, of strategy is uh, the one that is based on funnel and persona. In order to execute this kind of strategy, two things need to happen. First, you need to have as you said before, marketing automation platform in place. The second point is that you really need to know your audience uh, because the whole idea of funnel-based and persona-based content marketing is the following. We create content 
that uh, are relevant to each and every stage of the funnel. We simplified it, it, it here in this slide uh, by dividing it to three, awareness, research, and intent to buy. Here you have an example from our own blog that we have, basically we have your three content piece, pieces. One is a very general content piece. We run events called B2B Talks uh, here in Tel Aviv uh, where um, industry experts, Yale was one of our guests in the past, um, industry experts come and talk about their experience in solving their, their marketing challenges. Um, and when we do that, we create content around it, but it's not something that is specific for selling a specific service of an interview. Um, so this is the kind of content that we create in order to create awareness. Then we'll create content about the research phase. For example, when people want to buy marketing technology, uh, they will find our content. Uh, that talks about the different types of technologies required in order to build what we call a sales and marketing machine. This is coming more relevant to the research, research phase. The intent phase, intent to buy, is really deep down the funnel. And here we write content that is, for example, a comparison of different marketing automation solutions, one of the services that we provide. People that read this content, we know already that they are uh, in an actual buying decision process. And when they reach this content, we are able to start to work with them through our sales channel. But in order to create this content uh, machine, we need to understand what people are looking for in their awareness level, what people are looking for in their research level, and what people are looking for in the intent to buy. To tell the truth, the people in your organization that have this knowledge are actually the sales team. Because the sales team are the ones that are talking with the customers on an ongoing basis, they are talking with the prospect, and they know a lot about what people ask in different stages of the funnel. So that's one part of the game, or one part of the puzzle. The other part of the puzzle, and that's specifically for your question, Zoha, the other part of the, part, the, the puzzle is to actually connect it to the persona. So here you see an example that, uh, of, uh, of a very, very basic content program uh, that talks about uh, specific buyers of marketing automation. We just took marketing automation as an example for this, uh, for this slide. When a CMO wants to buy marketing automation, in the awareness phase, a uh, CMO will ask himself, how will, how will this bring me new leads, right? Help me with my KPIs. And in the research, they will, will, uh, will try to better understand the benefits of marketing automation. So we create content for a CMO in the awareness phase. In this case, it's a blog post. It's long gated content. Uh, in the research phase, we do a webinar with product demonstration, usually in research and, and one, step, uh, one step ahead, we would like to have the contact details of the person uh, that is interested in that content. But there are other uh, people that affect the buying decision process. Uh, in the example of marketing information, a CFO also um, uh, affects the decision. They are asking a bit of different questions. They are asking a question about ROI. They are asking about total cost of ownership. So we create content that is relevant for the CFO as well. So basically, we have another uh, another uh, a matrix. We have the final stage, and we have the persona. And based on that, we build a matrix of the content that we need to provide uh, at each stage of the funnel. Questions uh, so far? OK, just feel free to add your questions. Uh, it pops up on our screen here, and we'll, uh, we'll be able to answer. The last and the most sophisticated uh, content strategy is engagement-based. Uh, the engagement-based content strategy is saying the following. This is especially relevant for long sales cycles, whether it's B2B or B2C. The thing is that in long sales cycles and com complex sales cycles, we would like to keep the decision makers in what we call our sphere of influence. We would like them to continuously engage with us, to continuously talk with us, to uh, read our blog, to open the email that we are sending to them, to come to our events. Even if our events are not uh, aimed at selling them anything, we just want them to constantly uh, think about us when they will hit, because we know that when they will hit, the need for one of our services or products, we will already be there. There is already trust that was established with these, uh, with these buyers. In order to do that, we are creating another layer, basically, of content that its goal is to keep people engaged with us. 
for from the media group, it's the uh, B2B talk. General events for B2B marketers, talking about general topics of interest, not necessarily about things that we are selling. Uh, other companies are creating a lot of thought leadership content, think tanks, this kind of content that continuously keeps people engaged. We're not trying to sell in this content to do anything. We just want to make sure that we continue the conversation. And actually, this webinar is a part of this engagement process uh, that we have with our customers. But in a specific point in time, we are putting out what we call compelling event content. We are putting content that is relevant to the funnel. And when someone hits that content, they are being automatically pushed into a nurturing flow. Okay? And that's a very, 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 very important uh, uh, element here. So we identify the willingness to buy because we see that they are actually reading content that is bottom of the funnel kind of content. For example, vendor comparison or total cost of ownership calculator. And when they do that, we are able to know that now it's the time to start a sudden content which is based on the funnel and their persona. Marketing automation is crucial in order to uh, get this thing done. You cannot do it without that. That is very I, now, uh, I think that um, you should add to your matrix. I mean, if we go back to the, f to the first slide with the three um, kind of strategies, you, meant, you said that um, they vary both in effort and in results. I think that they also vary in, um, in time to see ROI. Because for the engagement uh -huh. strategy, uh -huh. I think it may, it, takes, it may take much longer to actually measure the results because you, you need to first engage people and only then you put them in the nurturing flow. I mean, I see the potential here. I haven't tried it myself, I must admit, but it does take more time to implement and also for the person to go through the entire cycle. Yeah, I agree with you. Completely agree with you. Any questions before we, uh, we go to, um, to insights from Yao? Okay. So I'm making your presenter now. Okay. So uh, while I'm sharing my screen with you, um, I want to ask everybody, are you currently doing any form of content repurposing? Please write in the chat box just yes and no, and if you want to explain further, feel free to add any comments. And we'll get to that part uh, later on. So uh, Kfir, you talked a lot about the challenges and the strategies behind uh, content marketing. And I want to talk more, a little bit more about uh, the context, OK? Um, I hope everybody can see, can see my screen already. So um, let's talk about context. Uh, what we see here now is a watch. And what is a watch? A watch is basically a tool to help us know what time it is today. Um, it's a device. It's very simple. It has a purpose. But there is so much more to it, right, if we only add the element of context. And we can see now two different contacts for the same device. Um, and a watch can really be so many different things for so many different people, depending on uh, the context of who these people are, where they are, what state of mind they are. The same thing if we're taking this to, um, to B2B and technology marketing. Um, if, we're, if we're trying to define the context of our users, we need to think of many different things. For example, we're, we're creating content that is going to meet our users where and when. Um, for example, um, right now we have people in this call that are coming from different places in the world. For some of you, you're just starting your day. Uh, maybe you're having your first coffee while listening to our webinar. Uh, for the rest of you, maybe it's the end of the day and you're tired. And uh, if we're not going to be engaging enough, you're probably not going to uh, get any value out of this webinar. So we really need to think about those things when we're creating content. And obviously, with a webinar, maybe it's easier because you know what time of day it's going to be. When you're pushing content out there, you're not sure which time of day your, um, your reader is going to meet your content, but you can pretty much aim 
um, and, and think that they're probably going to be at work or at home depending on the goal of your content and um, what state of mind they're going to be. You need to think about what they're doing right now, what, what is their level of attention. For example, if somebody was searching for something online and happened to fall across your content, they might not have the full attention to read your content if it's not answering the exact question that they were looking for. They might glance at it, but they'll probably continue after a few seconds to search for that thing they really came out there to search. On the other hand, if they're on uh, social media, if they're on Twitter or Facebook and they saw a post that links to your content and they clicked on that post because they were interested in uh, the title, then the, the, chances, the most chances are you'll be getting more of their attention. Uh, what, are, what are they really looking for right now? Are, are they looking to buy? Are they only looking to do some research? Um, I do a lot of research sometimes for articles that I write, so most chances are I'm not, I'm not in a buying mood. I mean, I'm just looking for answers for questions in order to include them in my, in my posts. Um, but still, I might encounter some content that's going to uh, make me curious. Um, what is my state of mind? I mean, have I been fighting with my husband last night? Um, if I did, then I might not be as positive when I'm reading the content that you've created for me. So we need to kind of, I know it, it sounds really hard, but we need to kind of take all of this into consideration when we're creating any type of content. Now if we uh, look at the, at the funnel, and uh, Kfir, you talked about three stages. I broke it down for uh, a little bit more than that because um, when we're creating content, our job is to engage people from starting from the awareness stage through consideration and all the way up to purchase and uh, retention and upsell. So our job doesn't end when somebody buys a product. And on each one of those stages, our, um, our goal is very different. So when our client is the awareness stage, our goal is to get leads. And to get leads, we need to help people by solving their problems and answering all of their questions. When they're already in the consideration stage, we need to provide them with case studies, with uh, demos, uh, product reviews, uh, in order to nurture them. And when they're already interested in the product, we need to enhance that interest by providing social proof and, uh, again, case studies. Uh, once they're already in purchase stage, we need to, first of all, make sure that um, we are accompanying the purchase stage. Sometimes, especially with complex sales, I mean, the last sale that we, we did at Rushum took, I think, a month and a half just to, to sign the contract. So during that stage, we still need to nurture uh, the clients. So we still need to provide them with valuable information like how-to guides, product demos, and features overviews. In this point, our goal is, one, to help the sales team nail the sale. Uh, once we already have the customer um, as a paying customer, we still need to provide um, valuable content for them. First of all, to prevent uh, people leaving our product uh, to reduce churn. And um, the other thing which is not less important is we want people to be engaged not to actually advocate for our product. And uh, I think this has proven to be one of the most successful marketing um, strategies for our company at Rujum, uh, that we keep nurturing clients even after they, they, they've paid us and they become the best salespeople. Um, to sell the product onwards. So if we sum it up, if we uh, take the content and we add context to it, what we're creating is a story. And if we think of ourselves when we're kids, we really we think of a kid that is waiting for bedtime uh, story just to sit with their mom and dad and hear about you know, the latest fairy tale. We're, we're not different. You know, we, we might have grown up since then, but we still like good and engaging uh, stories. Nothing has changed. So, um, Phil, can you tell me how many people replied yes to the question about repurposing content? Mm -hmm. Or no? Two and two now. Two yes and two no? Two yes and one no. 
Okay. Um, so the rest of you are doing neither, <laughs> um, or just too shy to answer. Um, well, my guess is uh, at least a third of you guys, uh, or at least or more, fifty percent of you guys are repurposing content, even if you don't know it yet. Um, Repurposing content is basically taking the same idea and implementing it in a new way in order to reach a new audience. In the same way, we can take one piece of content that is relevant for one stage of our funnel and repurpose it to match another stage uh, by using a different format. And we know that today we have a lot of different formats for content available for us, starting with written content like blog posts and white papers, and uh, all the way uh, going through infographics, slideshows, uh, webinars like we're doing now, online courses, presentations, content journeys. Uh, so we really, we don't need to go very far in order to find new content, new content formats uh, to reach new audiences. And what repurposing content um, is really all about is increasing ROI because as we've seen, we need to be creating a lot of content in order to meet demand. We have a lot of customers in different stages of the funnel. Each one of them needs different types of content. And if we'll, um, if we'll have even a team of writers and let them create content every time from scratch, it's going to take a lot of resources. But if we're taking the same idea and basically everybody um, in whatever stage of the funnel your, your uh, clients are, they're interested in the same topic. So basically what repurposing does is help you, helps you take the same idea and present it in a different way to match a different context. Now, my colleague uh, Ben Jacobson from Playbuzz, which is one of the biggest sites in the world, ranked I think 400 um, in the United States, says that a lot of their B2B content that is used to capture leads at the awareness stage is later repurposed as educational content to empower onboarded clients. Now I want to take a look at a case study uh, from a company called Pioneer. Basically, Pioneer invested uh, a lot of time and resources creating a really engaging video. And they're using this video in different stages of the buying cycle. Uh, they're actually using Vroom in order to do that, and Vroom helps them uh, add the context. For example, this is um, a piece of content that is used in the acquisition stage. So you see on the right side the video itself, and on the left side you see uh, a comment uh, that says, watch how easy it is. Because when, they're, when people are in the acquisition stage, Pioneer wants to show them that it's very easy in order to uh, attract them. The call to action here says sign up because they're trying to um, encourage people to sign up for an account. The same video is then repurposed uh, to use in the on onboarding pr uh, uh, process. So, this time, this video is served to clients that have already opened an account, but they're not active yet. So Pioneer wants to show them some more benefits of the product. The benefits are mentioned inside of the video, but in order to um, get people's attention to the right part of the video, again, they are using the, uh, the left side of the page in order to add the comments and the insights. So basically what they're doing is they're using the same video, but with a different context. And you can notice that this time the call to action is sign in because those people already have an account and the goal of this piece of content is to get them to sign into their account. So if we sum up um, the part about context, uh, when we create content, we need to, to think about what is the context um, and how it affects our users. What stage of the buying cycle they're currently at, and what is the, re the most relevant story that we can tell them considering this context? Are there any questions so far? So one of the questions that uh, I got was from one of the viewers is, how do I start? What do I do first? Let's say you want to build this amazing platform and use all those content strategies, but we are starting from scratch. We have 
a traditional uh, marketing organization in place? How do we start to move to this direction? What are your tips for that, Yael? So that's a great question, and I, I uh, think a few years backwards to when I started working for Rujum, and I only wish I knew then what I know now, um, because I was basically clueless. I had no idea where, where to start. Um, and I think that er everyone has different ideas. Uh, my uh, two cents is start with two places. Start with Google or search engines and start with your clients. Now with Google, all you have to do is go in there and start typing in questions. The Google will auto-complete your questions so you will know what people are mostly asking. Um, and you can also see um, um, by the amount of search results how many people have already answered this question. If you can find questions that are commonly asked but not commonly answered, then it's, it will be easier for you to create content that's unique and not already out there. The second place is go to your clients. Even if you're just starting out and you don't have clients uh, already, you have potential clients. And um, this, this is actually uh, a tactic that we use a lot. We actually go to people who are in our target audience. We don't try to sell them anything. We just reach out to them and tell them that we're trying to get um, into the telecom industry or whatever industry that is, and we'd like to ask them a few questions. We set up a, a, a call or we do an email exchange, and we simply ask them what are the topics that you're interested in? What kind of questions do you have about this or about that? Um, and this gives us the ideas of uh, which content to create. Cool. Um, for us, what we see, it really depends on the size of the company. Um, one of the challenges for larger companies, for enterprises, uh, is that in many cases, this kind of initiative starts uh, bottom up. They are not coming from, uh, uh, from top management, uh, or at least in some of the cases. And in these cases, the ones that are the champions of uh, introducing these kind of marketing tools, uh, they need to convince upper management that this is something that's worth investing. Um, so one of the things that we saw that worked very well is actually to, uh, to take one specific program uh, that has a high chance of success, start with that, bring great results, and then go to management and say, you see, we got these results uh, uh, by using this amount of budget on only one program. Um, we would like now to scale it to multiple programs or to multiple divisions and so on. Uh, that's something that uh, is, is making the life of, uh, of the corporate champion much easier uh, in case that uh, they are facing uh, uh, management that is not really keen on investing too much in this kind of tactics. Okay, let's, uh, if this is the case, let's go to uh, uh, some of the top tips that we had in mind. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, you have the right technology in place, whether it's routine to uh, repurpose your content, marketing automation, proper tracking, uh, CRM integrated with the whole thing. The technology part is crucial in order to measure and optimize your marketing, uh, content marketing activities. Uh, the second tip is find the right strategy that, strategy that fits your company's maturity. Um, again, a very important point. Try to figure out when should you introduce uh, additional efforts into your organization. Uh, and make sure that you have the, the backing of, of, of top management. Again, this is especially important in larger in enterprises and, and larger companies. And continuously uh, engage with, your, uh, with the audience in order to constantly keep them in your sphere, sphere of influence. And the next tip are Yael's. So always consider the current context of your customer. Uh, consider where they are, when they're going to see your content, what stage of the funnel they are, uh, what state of mind they might be, and uh, what kind of attention uh, they have for your content. And the next tip is uh, save time by repurposing content in different stages of the funnel. You'd be surprised how once you master kind of repurposing, how much time can it save you and how much it can increase your ROI. Okay. 
So uh, unless you have any other questions, uh, you can always uh, reach out to us. Uh, in this, uh, you have here uh, Yael and my email addresses, and of course our Twitter handles. Uh, so if you, you have any questions, you are more than welcome to contact us. We will also send you this the video recording and the slide uh, on a later date for further reference. Um, we hope that uh, we've been in service and uh, looking forward to hear more about your uh, your challenges in the content marketing landscape. Thank you, everyone, everyone, for your time. It was a pleasure being with you today.